So again, my name is Andrew Ristby. Some of you may know me. I'm an extension specialist here uh, for, uh, uh, for commercial horticulture. Mm -hmm. And um, my area of specialty primarily is ornamental horticulture. Uh, and I focus in on nutrient management and irrigation management. But the problem is that no one wants to hear about nutrient management. And so oftentimes when I'm talking about that, I get a lot, a lot of people are falling asleep. So I always wanted to do something different. Uh, when I first started this job, I thought it'd be kind of cool to uh, get into some alternative crops and do some, you know, odd crops. Uh, and so the first one that I ran across was aronia, and I've been doing aronia research for a long time. And, you know, that ne didn't necessarily turn out to be a hot crop that I thought it might be back in uh, 2005 when I first started. But, um, but uh, I, I found out some really interesting stuff about this, and I have a partner down at Un University of Maryland Eastern Shore who's a phytochemist and a polymer chemist and we've got some really interesting things that we're doing with this crop right now including using it as a, a, an, an educational tool for uh, students involved in um, agricultural science but I'm going to talk to you about my aronia research uh, and I'm going to talk about two other crops that I've been working with one's a winner and one I think is a loser uh, and it's one of those things where you know if I can convince you to grow a crop because it makes money for you then I've done my job but if I can convince you not to grow a crop because you're gonna lose money off of it um, I've done my job too so uh, these uh, crops that I'll be talking about um, physalis or physalis uh, which is uh, ground cherries uh, or golden berries uh, depending on which species you're referring to I think uh, occasionally you'll see these in the supermarket uh, they're in those uh, clear oyster packs, and uh, they're making a lot of money off of them, or at least somebody is. Uh, most of those are coming from Colombia, uh, uh, but I know there's some farm markets that are growing um, uh, another uh, uh, species, uh, and you see that uh, uh, occasionally here and there, and that's the one I really want to focus on and talk to you about. Uh, I'll talk about Hascap. Anyone ever heard of Hascap? Yeah, has anyone tried growing it? Has anyone, okay, that's good. I'll get your opinion on that. Where are you located? Central Maryland. Central Maryland. Probably a little better than the Eastern Shore for Hascap. Anyone interested or even thought about growing it? No? Okay. So, yeah, that's uh, probably a good thing. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, I tell you, it's a really interesting crop, and, and actually the phytochemistry of it is very similar to Aronia. Uh, but it's got some issues and we'll talk about them and then we'll talk about aronia so uh, you pass this going or coming here this morning this is just the out front we've got two high tunnels and I've got my uh, aronia plots out there and I have my hascap plots and then I grow the the facilis or the physalis which is the way I call it um, the researcher up in Cornell doing research is called it physalis so I'm gonna try to focus try to stick to that uh, term uh, or that pronunciation uh, and uh, I grow that in either one of the two high tunnels I switch back and forth and Chris has been helping me out with the past couple years with that uh, as did Mike Newell in the past so uh, the two species uh, I'll be referring to uh, about is uh, Physalis peruviana which is the golden berry per se and then uh, Physalis gracia which is the um, uh, the ground cherry or the husk cherry uh, the golden berry is very popular uh, and uh, it c goes under a lot of different names. The chuva, which is the South American name where the plant originally came from. Uh, Cape gooseberry, uh, for, they grow it in uh, South Africa and, um, uh, and, and uh, they call it Cape gooseberry. And then physalis is what they call it in, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, the, the gracia species, it's uh, called the ground cherry or husk cherry. Uh, in Europe, uh, this is a popular plant. They put it in their candies, they put it in their pastries, uh, and uh, it, it is really interesting. Uh, it's relatively easy to grow. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it has, it, it, because of those, you know, interests in, in healthy foods, it has a high uh, antioxidant content, specifically the lipophilic, the carotenoid uh, 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 type of antioxidant, so that's good for you. High in minerals, and it's got this high market value. You, in these packages, it's three ounces for four bucks. And it's like, well, can our growers here capitalize on that? Um, and so that's what I was thinking. It's maybe it, somewhere around there. It might actually be a relatively profitable, profitable crop so long as we can grow it in, uh, in Maryland. So the difference between these two, um, Gracia is a smaller fruit. 
Uh, and, uh, and let's just talk about the fruit for the time being. Smaller fruit, it's got a different flavor than most fruits, kind of like a, a pineapple custard. Most people ca kind of uh, think it's kind of got this pineapple custard flavor. It's, it's actually very interesting. I like it a lot. Uh, do you grow the uh, Grisia or the Peruviana? Oh, yeah, so, I'm sorry, you were growing Hascaps, I apologize. Yeah, so has anyone ventured into these yet? You have? So which one are you growing? The, the, the one that's kind of sprawl, sprawling yeah. plant? Yeah. Um, the Peruviana is a taller plant. It's not as productive, uh, more difficult to grow, uh, and, uh, but it has a really lemony type of citrusy flavor, which is really interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of research being done in Cornell uh, with this crop, which I can uh, uh, talk to you about. Uh, in the high tunnels, uh, somewhere out about mid-July, um, this is what they look like, both of these really tall varieties. I was testing out a variety of different solanaceous species in here, including uh, Gracia. But the Peruviana was a really tall plant to the point where you had to support it uh, because it would fall over. Uh, I was doing high tunnel work because I was trying to figure out if they would work in a high tunnel. Uh, throughout the season and uh, maybe to understand maybe uh, you know how we could extend the season or at least open up a window making it a little earlier if you could get it in on early March at what point would these plants start fruiting uh, and uh, uh, and that worked out really well to a point uh, the uh, you can see the uh, the, the fruit uh, basically hangs from these, um, uh, uh, you know, frank hangs from the, the branches, the, uh, the, the calyxes or the, 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 that surrounding uh, 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 skin is really uh, nice, especially uh, for, uh, for the gracia, because the gracia, when it's ripe, it falls off. So it's nice to have that natural skin around the fruit so you're not worried about cleaning it all the time. Uh, the, the Peruviana was actually rather difficult to, to harvest. I had to get up underneath that plant. I had to pull the fruit off of the, um, off the branches. Uh, and it took some time uh, and a lot of effort. Uh, and, uh, and I'll talk about pests. And, and uh, this, this plant had, had some problems that I really didn't know how to deal with. Gracia, on the other hand, is a quick growing, sprawling plant. Um, you'll see that, that when the fruit is ripe, it falls off, which makes it really easy to harvest. I liked having my uh, black plastic floor because all I needed to do was come in with a, a shot back and suck them all up and then just sort them out um, and it made it really easy and they, they're, they're prolific in, um, in production which was really nice and if you're selling it for you know a pint for three dollars in a farm market um, you can make a lot of money off this plant uh, and, uh, and, and again it's, it's, it has a really attractive flavor and it's one of those things at the farm market you just let people try it uh, in most cases, um, uh, it, it, they, they, people really do like it. I wanted to do, of course, nutrient management studies because that's what I do. I wanted to know what nitrogen rates to apply. The only written publication information about these are working with tomatillos. The tomatillos are in the same family. They're fistulous also. Uh, and uh, there's a, a, several different nitrogen rates that I looked at for recommendations, um, none of it which is in any Maryland uh, 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 in any Maryland recommendations. But I think I got some from OSU and Michigan, and they ranged anywhere from 150 to 250 pounds an acre. And that would, of course, be in, uh, in row. But that's a lot of, that's a lot of nitrogen. Um, I had trouble applying that much nitrogen in a row, uh, and so, I, so my rates were relatively low, uh, and I'll show you what they were. Um, so I was working with 25, 50, and 100 pounds per acre in row, uh, and you can see uh, from my harvest, uh, and I did uh, a bi-weekly harvest, I got this crop in late, later than I really wanted to. Uh, one of my first crops that I had put in the high tunnel, I, got, I started getting a harvest in mid-June which was uh, two weeks earlier than anyone else. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to germinate your seeds uh, in January and get them growing and get them tall enough. You can see what I had here. They were at least to six or eight inches tall and strong enough that they pretty much support themselves. I did have little bamboo stakes to get those going because when the wind whipped through these high tunnels, it would knock them around quite a bit. And then again, they're also sprawling, so they want to lay down and, uh, and, and grow uh, 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 laterally. So uh, you could see 
from, uh, from my results, it looked like the best rates was around 100 pounds an acre. Uh, if I am able to get these plants in the ground this year, uh, I want to try um, uh, extending that to maybe up to 200 pounds an acre and see if there's any difference uh, in, that, uh, in, that, uh, in, in those rates with, with harvest or yield. Uh, you can see um, by, uh, by, let's say, you know, I put, these, I put these, this crop in probably around, um, uh, I would say, uh, uh, late April. And by mid-June, that's the size of them. Uh, and, uh, and later on, they, they really start sprawling. So you really have to control their growth. And it was a lot of work, uh, frankly. Uh, and another interesting thing is, um, is, and how I controlled their growth was I basically was taking uh, the laterals that were growing along the ground and I would clip them uh, so that I would just kind of make them focus on upward growth. And that helped out a little bit. Uh, but in general, it's a really tough plant to try to control because it really wants to sprawl. Uh, it's, it would be nice if there was some, uh, I think some growers tried to, to develop a catchment system to keep them upright to, uh, by, uh, by strings and rope uh, and to uh, get the, the fruit to fall in a basket or a net that they would have uh, set up. I found that rather difficult to, to manage myself, so it was the shot back for me. Uh, you also notice, uh, nutritionally speaking, that these plants have a really high potassium uh, requirement. And if you can, you might want to supplement uh, with uh, potassium sulfate or something like that through the drip line. Do you find um, uh, potassium problems with your crop at, at any time? No, I haven't noticed. I'm always happy with the yield. Good. Yeah. Yeah, what about like the, yeah, the, the yield doesn't seem to doesn't matter, but the leaves start showing these yellow margins. And I think that's a potassium issue, at least uh, from the leaf analysis that I was doing. So they do need a high potassium requirement. Um, the thing is, in a high tunnel, it gets really hot. And after my first year, which worked really well, and it's probably because it was a relatively cool summer, um, every year after that, by uh, late July, they had just crap right out. Uh, and this is kind of what they look like. Um, and, uh, and so what I would suggest, if you wanted to go with this, is you do a high tunnel, but know that the crops aren't going to last much past July. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then try to do some outside production, too. And again, if you can manage a, uh, a plastic, a black plastic uh, 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 a cover for the soil, it's a lot easier to try to, uh, uh, to, to sweep them up or vacuum them in a way uh, to harvest them. My insect problems were uh, a few. Uh, I had, uh, especially with the stressful environment in a high tunnel uh, that didn't get a whole lot of air circulation, uh, by mid-July I was getting a lot of mites. Uh, this is a, a spotted mite uh, and uh, white flies. Uh, and by this time, I was ready to just pack up because it just wasn't worth managing these in that way. The biggest problem that I had from seedling to adult was the uh, three-line lemma beetle. Has anyone ever seen this? Yeah, of course you have. And it's odd because I'd never seen this, plant, this, this, uh, this beetle before until I started growing this crop. And it is, it, it's ravenous for this crop, especially when it's young. Uh, and this is a problem. Now, it's in the potato beetle family. Uh, and uh, there are the eggs, and they lay them underneath the, the leaves. So um, they're yellow. They're bright yellow. So they're easy to see if you're bothering to lift up all the leaves on the plants, which, of course, no one wants to do. Um, this is uh, the growth stages. They're like potato beetles. So um, by the time they, uh, they get uh, pretty decent size, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're throwing their frass on their backs as a distraction maybe uh, for, uh, for, for predators. Um, but uh, but it, 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 it's just a, a big problem. And they have this voracious appetite. And as, when your plants are small, they are really cleaning out uh, the leaf material. They are, they're, they're defoliating quite quickly. Um, and as the, as the plants get bigger, uh, you know, into uh, like from the, that second picture that I showed you of, of, of the of very sizable plants, these don't have much of an effect because the, the crop is outgrowing their, the, 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 uh, the, the, the predation. But again, um, the, the, you know, the, one of the problems that I had with this is trying to decide what the heck I should uh, apply to control this uh, crop. Now, um, in the, all the insecticides that I, that I, that, that I find that are labeled for uh, uh, fissilis or ground cherry, and there are some, like uh, I think uh, 
uh, uh, 7, and, uh, uh, which is a carbaryl, uh, and even spinosad, which is something you might want to use later on when you want to be careful uh, with uh, pollinators. Um, they're not labeled for a three-line lemma beetle because <laughs> no one knows about it. And so you could get away maybe by thinking or by, by telling your uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture person, well, it's a potato beetle because um, physalis or the ground cherries labeled for these insecticides being labeled for, uh, uh, for, for ground cherries are also labeled for Colorado potato beetle. All right, the problem is, is that Colorado potato beetle doesn't eat this. Uh, uh, Three-line lemma beetle does. So that's a problem that I had with this crop and the recommendations I have for just about nothing you can do uh, in, in regardless. Uh, there's nothing labeled. Um, on top of that, if you're going to go ahead and, and try something, you know, your honeybees and your ants are, are what's pollinating these crop. So if you're going to use something, you might, you, you probably need to use something soft, all right, if you're going to go ahead and, and do whatever, because you don't want to kill these, uh, these pollinators. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so it's important to be real careful. Uh, with Peruviana, um, I, like I said, I, I thought this was an interesting plant. I love the flavor. But the biggest problem that I had uh, five years ago when I, when I worked with this crop originally, and last year when I got new varieties from, uh, 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 from uh, Cornell, uh, was this same moth, which basically puts a hole in the, uh, in, in the cover, in the calyx, and then, uh, uh, and then inside, before you know it, you know, you think you're growing fruit, but you open it up and it's just, there's no fruit in there. It's pretty much frass and, and, uh, and, and dead fruit, uh, you know, of rotting fruit. Uh, I was able to find a larva and, um, uh, and, and, and basically grow it out, and this was the moth that, that appeared. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but uh, the, the researcher in Cornell knows exactly what this, uh, this animal is. Uh, and or this moth and so uh, and so I, it'd be nice if you could spray BT on this but BT is not labeled for uh, for uh, uh, for this crop unfortunately um, you, this is the Joyce Van Eck she's uh, at the uh, Boyce Thompson Institute at Cornell they are really focused on on doing genetic work with this crop to uh, uh, make it uh, more tasty increase the size and the yield uh, and its growth habit uh, which would be nice, and I think she's working on both species, Grisia and especially Peruviana. Uh, they have a page, a web page on this, so I thought that this again is really interesting. So keep your eyes out for this crop. Um, certainly, uh, uh, it would be nice if uh, some of the the companies that are doing the agrochemicals for this crop for pests uh, might think about um, the issues uh, with three-line lemma beetle. And I'm not sure; it all comes down to your state. A Department of Agriculture and then telling you, well, if it's in the potato beetle family, maybe you can spray it or not. I don't know. Uh, that's one of the things. I know Maryland is very, um, pretty strict on what you can spray things on for the target. Um, and uh, some of this, uh, they're doing research with gene editing on this. And if you're not into uh, Franken fruit, uh, I, I understand, um, but uh, this is a quick way to, to, uh, to, uh, to get fruit uh, the way you want them. And, uh, and they're doing these uh, ty types of, uh, of, of gene editing to get the uh, traits that they want off of this crop. Again, I thought it was interesting that they, that they were actually putting in a lot of money and, and effort into this particular fruit. Let's go on to Hascap, uh, Linicera uh, cerulea. Uh, Hascap is a, uh, a native, a, a species of, 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 of honeysuckle that's native to northern Japan and Siberia. So you kind of get the idea of why it may not work you know, on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, in British Columbia and in Saskatchewan, uh, those two provinces are working heavily on, on breeding this uh, plant. Uh, and uh, along the northern tier of the United States, uh, uh, in Washington, in Oregon, in Michigan, uh, they're growing this crop uh, pretty well. Uh, and I also understand that there's some uh, production in uh, Massachusetts too. Why did I get into this? Because a lot of people are asking about Hascap. Um, uh, and, uh, and I thought, well, what the heck, why don't I contact a, uh, a, a researcher in Oregon and find out um, uh, more information about it. Plus, along, along that lines, I met someone at the American Society of Horticultural Science Conference 
who had uh, a research program on this. He was getting his uh, PhD on it. So I talked more about him and he said, oh no, this Maxine Thompson is the person to, uh, to talk to because she was actually doing breeding. She's in Oregon and originally was with Washington State Extension. So I got a hold of her and she gave me four different um, uh, new varieties to work with that she had bred. And I said, if anything, I really need varieties that are resistant to uh, uh, powdery mildew because that's something that, uh, that we have here in Maryland. In fact, you know, I, I, I kind of joke, if you want to know if a plant gets a disease, grow it in Maryland. Uh, and this is one of those problem plants. Uh, it, 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 I don't really see that it's really hitting, uh, hitting this plant hard, the powdery mildew, but this plant really does suffer in, in mid-July uh, when it really should be growing. I got these four varieties. Um, you need at least three varieties to get pollination because it has to cross-pollinate. And each variety is just a cutting or a clone, and it won't pollinate. If you have 12 plants and they're all clones of each other, they're not going to cross-pollinate. So you've got to get other varieties uh, that, to, uh, to get uh, good pollination. And it takes several years for this fruit to come, uh, to, to, for this plant to come into good fruit production. Uh, it took three years for me, actually. And at Y, uh, phenolo phenologically speaking, they, uh, they, they bloom in late April. Uh, you've got bumblebees that are, that are, that are on these plants. Uh, I, I didn't find any problems with pests. I don't have any pest insects that are tearing this plant up. And I didn't find any diseases on the fruit either, uh, which is a good thing. Um, uh, you'll see uh, at, in, in, that the fruit ripens. They're beautiful fruit, uh, gorgeous color. It ripens in late May, uh, early June. Um, the fruit is really high in anth anthocyanin content. And we'll talk about anthocyanin content in a little bit. But anthocyanins are phytochemicals that are known to be really high in antioxidant activity. So as a, as a food for us, a rather healthy food. Um, I had a lot of issues with, with humid weather, um, with powdery mildew. I never really saw a lot of powdery mildew. but but the leaves would just sort of start getting brown. I never saw the actual um, uh, 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 powdery mildew spores, but I, but I was talking to Karen Rain um, uh, a, couple, uh, uh, a couple days ago, and she said, well, you don't necessarily need to see the spores and, and the white powder on the plant to know that, that it could be affected by it. Uh, so by July, these leaves are, are, are really um, starting to brown out where you expect to get some good vegetative growth, you're, we're not. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and these plants just kind of just, just peter out. They stop growing. And by the time uh, July, late July rolls around, they've got, their, uh, uh, they've got their dormant buds already set for the following year. Now, since the planting, um, uh, it, the fruit ripens two weeks or so earlier than higher latitudes. So what I was noticing um, and talking to other growers in higher latitudes that I was getting an earlier uh, fruit production, which makes sense because we have an earlier spring, right? But the problem is, is that um, our sunlight, because uh, we have our earlier uh, fruit production, or should I say we have an earlier season, our sunlight isn't up to capacity at that point. We're not getting those uh, long days, uh, you know, by this time. And so, you know, if you're working into mid-June um, in, uh, uh, in Michigan or, uh, or Washington or even uh, up in Canada, you're getting really long daylight hours. And so I think this is the problem that I was having because I'd get this sour plum flavor. You've had a plum that has a sour flavor to it, um, like the beach plums. Well, this is exactly what that flavor was like. And I was told that these were rather sweet. Uh, and we're just not getting good sugar production out of this crop. Um, we're getting the anthocyanins, which is a different issue altogether. But as far as eating, um, they weren't that pleasant. Um, and, uh, and what I plan on doing um, is, uh, is, is, is uh, getting uh, seven more varieties from a nursery in Michigan that are known to, uh, to be really prolific. Note that the varieties that I had gotten were only, um, uh, were only bred by Maxine Thompson, and she really hadn't had a chance to, to test them out. So these ones that I'm getting from Michigan this year and putting in the ground, um, I want to see how well they do here uh, because they're more well known for their production. All right, let's, uh, let's go on to Aronia. Uh, why did I get into Aronia? Well, 
I, when I first started here, uh, I knew I needed to do something a little different than nutrient management. And, I, and I, uh, I wanted to do some alternative crops. And I did a lot of research on aronia as, a, uh, 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 as, a, uh, as an alternative crop, but especially in the ornamental sense. Uh, the uh, the red-fruited aronia, which is native to the coastal plain uh, where we are, um, is a really resistant plant uh, to diseases and pests. And so I wanted to know um, more about aronia, and I was kind of just going through the grocery store looking at uh, ingredients on juices, and I noticed that aronia was an ingredient in, uh, in a lot of your darker colored juices uh, back, you know, 12 or 15 years ago. Uh, and so I did a little more research, and I found that aronia, uh, aronia arbutifolia, has a cousin, aronia melanocarpa, the black-fruited aronia. Uh, so I decided that I would start working with that, and I got, um, you know, about 70 or so plants. I, I was able to get some money from the Hughes Center of Agroecology to work on native plants, uh, to look at uh, their production, to look at their nutrient management. Uh, and so aronia was one of those. Why did I choose aronia? Well, you know, it's a native fruit, which at the time I was really, uh, uh, really, really up on. Uh, it inhabits the mid-Atlantic region, primarily in the Piedmont, uh, and also, you know, it has a, a really large range, I found, from all the way up uh, from Newfoundland across to Michigan, down through Alabama, and across um, uh, into, from northern Georgia, and, and in, primarily in the, in the, uh, the mountainous and, and uh, cooler Piedmont regions. Uh, in Eastern Europe, though, what was really interesting is this plant has been extensively grown. Uh, so Eastern Europe, for Russia and Poland, also in Sweden and Norway, uh, uh, a lot of the Eastern countries uh, south of Poland, like Hungary, uh, 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 Romania, Serbia, it, it, it's everywhere in, the East, in these Eastern Bloc countries. And so I was really perplexed as to how in the world that plant got all the way over there and why they were growing it uh, uh, so much. Uh, the one, it was interesting because one of the, the first time I ever got aronia juice came along with a bottle of Polish vodka. And that's what, they, and I think that's what the, that's what the, in the Eastern Europe, that's what they like. They like mixing it with their vodka. But they also grow it for, uh, for candies. They make jellies out of it. And, uh, and the big thing, was that th that stuff that was in the juice, that aronia was actually concentrate that they would add to juice in the United States. That was coming from Poland, which has the largest aronia, um, uh, 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 largest aronia orchards uh, in the world, at the time at least. Uh, and they were, they were selling um, their concentrates to us so we could mix them in with our juices to improve the color of our juices. So it has this, again, extremely high anthocyanin content. Um, as we know so far uh, from my work that I, I do with uh, Dr. Volkus down at UMES, uh, this uh, polymer and phytochemist, um, we found that there's very few fresh fruit that have as high of an anthocyanin content as aronia does. Um, oddly enough, uh, hascap has a higher concentration. And there's this interesting, I think there's this interesting uh, arctic fruit that has it. Um, but it's not something like you're going to really put into high production down here. Uh, so again, for us, uh, it was a, a, you know, a really neat fruit to, to work with because of the potential health benefits. Uh, I think we've heard most, a lot about acai, which is that palm fruit from a, a South America. Well, to get that stuff up here, it all has to be processed. So I'm wondering, you know, what is the actual... Uh, health benefits and what is the actual anthocyanin content of acai juice by the time it gets here? Because we know um, from the research that they've done it down at UMES and other research, we know once you start heating, uh, which is uh, the typical way you process juice uh, through pasteurization, once you start heating it, those anthocyanins, they, they break down. So you really lose your health benefits. So if we can grow a crop here in the mid-Atlantic region, um, uh, that has this high uh, uh, anthocyanin health benefit uh, with a fresh fruit, that would be a bonus for, for growers who are interested in growing it. At least that's what I thought at the time. Now, what is this aronia that we're growing right now? Uh, so I told you about aronia melanocarpa, and that's the native uh, plant. Uh, but uh, uh, what happened was, uh, and this is some really interesting research uh, from a master's student in Connecticut who did some historical 
uh, uh, work looking at where this cultivated variety came from. And on top of that, they're actually looking at genetic research. They were, they were looking at the genes of this, of this particular cultivated crop. Uh, so what they found was uh, about, uh, and there's some records uh, in Russia, but in the, in the turn of the century, there was a, a, a Russian breeder. His name was Ivan Maturin. And he had somehow got a hold of Aronia melanocarpa, which was taken over to Europe at some point. And he crossed it with European mountain ash, Sorbus acuparia. Now, the interesting thing is, is, I didn't really understand this or know this, but Sorbus acuparia, Sorbus is a very promiscuous genus. And it actually interbreeds with other genus that are closely related to it, like Aronia. And the, resultant, uh, the resulting uh, uh, a hybrid um, was uh, now called Aronia maturinii uh, f after uh, Maturin, which had a larger fruit set, a larger yield, larger fruit in general, uh, uh, and it was ideal for cultivation. And I think that was Maturin's general idea. And I think that's where that crop became so popular in Eastern Europe because of Maturin's work, and it spread through there. Now, when I uh, started working with this crop, uh, I didn't think, I thought I was the only person working with it until I learned of a grower in Iowa. Uh, and in Iowa, uh, this same grower, pretty much we stumbled across this, this fruit. Now, he stumbled across it a lot earlier than me, and he developed a business out of it. Uh, uh, a, a, and so he was growing it and he was making cuttings and selling it to other growers and he kind of developed this, 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 uh, this relationship with other growers that he would buy their fruit, he would process it into jams and jellies uh, and then sell it amongst a lot of other things. Uh, so I went over there uh, probably around uh, 2012 and soon after the, there was an enormous explosion of aronia production in the Midwest. Nebraska, Iowa, um, uh, 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 let's see, what other states? Uh, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois. They really latched onto this. Um, now, as things go, you get these big hypes, these, these big surges in, in different fruit production, and it, it, everything kind of shakes out uh, in the, on the long run. In most cases, growers really thought that they could sell, they could grow the fruit and sell it, you know, without working at it. And that wasn't the case. Especially with new fruit that not many people know about, um, it's really hard to sell. Uh, including the fact that Aronia, uh, while it looks like a blueberry, and they call it a berry, it's not. What does that fruit actually look like? It looks like an apple. Look at the calyx. All right? Yeah, so, and that's what they are. They're, they're little apples or pears. And so, I would liken the flavor of this, not a blueberry. You know, people have put it in their mouth thinking they were going to have a blueberry in their mouth, and it wasn't that at all. It was uh, astringent because they chewed it up. It was the first thing I tell people. The first thing you do when you put it in your mouth is squeeze it in your mouth. Don't chew it up. Because the anthocyanidins, which are the tannins, make this fruit really astringent. So squeeze it in your mouth and taste that juice. The juice is really sweet. It has a very nice, pleasant flavor to it. But they're more like crab apples. So they have this kind of a, a sweet at first, but if you chew them up, uh, the tannins uh, really uh, give you that, that dry uh, flavor in your mouth. On top of it, the skin is rather thick, <laughs> just like an apple. And there's not a whole lot of pulp to wash it down with. So is anyone familiar with the common name of this fruit? Chokeberry. Chokeberry. And I know why. <laughs> Chew it up, try to swallow it, it gets caught in your mouth. Um, uh, or it get, gets caught in your throat. Uh, so, you know, there is a lot of, lot of potential detractions from this crop. I, I knew that going in. Um, but I thought, I thought there was a lot of things you could do with it. I've tasted the jam. I tasted the wine. I thought that there was a lot of potential. And in fact, there were a few brave souls that, um, that grabbed this plant uh, and, and really started working with it and, and had a lot of fun with it, I think. In fact, one is sitting here today. Uh, and this, this person, who I became very good friends with, learned how to make a fantastic wine out of this. In fact, this person won third place in the International Wine Contest in 
uh, it was the, uh, in, in um, uh, the, the, the Finger Lakes International Wine, Cost, contest, uh, International wine contest for a fruit wine. Uh, and how, how impressive can that be? Uh, unfortunately, um, things didn't go well with the county that he lives in, and uh, he had to shut down. Uh, and he's off on other ventures. Uh, but I really commend him for the work that he did in, uh, in finding a fruit and doing something with it. We have another grower in Chestertown who, uh, who grows this crop and sells it at the far Chestertown Farm Market. Uh, they do uh, uh, baked goods. I think uh, he has a uh, U pick also. Uh, he's organic. Uh, another grower in Denton was organic. Um, he was the main supplier of moms, uh, Ar Ar Aronia to moms uh, 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 markets. And um, unfortunately, his age, basically, he needed just to stop. So uh, he's not growing anymore. So there's a hole for anyone who wants to replace his uh, products to moms. Just, just telling you. Anyways, um, so a potential uses is ornamental value. Uh, there's a lot of uh, foods uh, that you can make with this. Uh, a delicious jam comes out of, of New Jersey, uh, Jalma Foods, uh, and uh, they are uh, Jalma Farms. And Alma George makes a fantastic jam. It's a low sugar. She uses industrial pectin. I tell you, this is one of the best jams I've ever tasted. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah. Cold pressed. Uh, you mentioned about heating. Is that cold pressed? Oh, with the jam? The, to get the juice. Uh, no. So no. So you no. Actually, yeah. Cold press. You freeze it. Right. And then you squeeze it. Okay. Freeze and squeeze. That was the only way I could figure out. Yeah. How to do it. Okay. Yeah. You freeze and squeeze. Now I remember I got one of those steamer juicers, and and that was a bad idea. Um, but uh, but no. You freeze the fruit. And then that, that fruit, I think, for, uh, I think you get a gallon of fruit for between 12 and 14 pounds of, of fruit. Uh, you can get a gallon of juice out of it. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and so, and, but here's the, 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 the wine maker here uh, would uh, just uh, ferment the fruit all together, would throw it in a, um, in a vat and ferment the fruit that way. Uh, and again, uh, I want to, I, I really, it was fantastic wine. I miss it. Um, and there it is right there. That was the wine. Uh, can be a value-added niche crop for small farms. There was, there's an association that, uh, that was created to help uh, uh, promote uh, the, uh, the education of this fruit. Uh, what's really important is, is, you know, we're all interested in these nutraceutical fruits, so I really thought that this was the way to go. And I thought that this would be, this would, you know, people would, would really uh, tie in on this. The phytochemicals are what we're looking at, the polyphenols. Um, like including anthocyanins, you know, uh, cranberries, high in polyphenols. We're taking that for a variety of different things. Uh, I think cranberries taste horrid compared to aronia. Have you ever had a fresh cranberry? Yeah. No, there's no question aronia is better tasting than cranberry. But look, cranberry is a major market, all right, because they can make a, a juice out of it and load it, load it with a lot of sugar, of course. But uh, aronia has more uh, uh, antioxidants does, than cranberry does, uh, especially these anthocyanins. Um, blackberries, blueberries, uh, elderberry are right up there too, just a little under. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, and of course, hascap is a little higher. So as far as anthocyanins go, it's, it's way up there. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so this is, again, one of those reasons why I was growing it. Cardiovascular health, gastrointestinal health, blood sugar, anti-inflammatory, the list goes on to the potential health benefits. And a lot of this research comes out of European health journals, that they were actually utilizing extracts uh, and such. And in fact, one study came out of Beltsville. They were feeding uh, mice that uh, were given high sugar diets and went into um, uh, sugar stress. They were fed, they fed aronia anthocyanins. Uh, and it, it brought them out of their uh, diabetic issues. Uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of potential good with this crop. As I, as, I, as was, I was, again, I think it's the problem. I think people would just rather eat um, a gallon of blueberries than a few handfuls of aronia. I don't know, maybe, maybe that's the case. Yeah? When you go into that, um, you know, talking about production, though, I'm, I'm picturing or guessing that making the jam is sort of like making quince jam. It's like a whole lot of sugar. Is that the case? I mean, well, maybe not as much as 
making cranberry juice or something out of cranberries, how much sugar. But isn't there quite a bit of sugar? There? And any jam is going to have quite a bit of sugar to it. And a lot of depends on how, how much pectin that fruit has naturally. Um, so uh, Alma, George, said that she had a low sugar um, uh, uh, fruit. So it was, she had more fruit in her uh, jam than sugar. So that's relevant. It's relative. Yeah, it is. sugar could be, you know, still a lot of sugar. Thirty tablespoons of sugar in I wouldn't say that it was yeah. amazingly sweet, but yeah, yeah. You, you get into the jam production, you got to do it. Yeah. You got to use sugar. Yeah. yeah. Especially with a fruit like this. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the phenology of this, uh, they bloom early uh, or mid-April to early May, depending on what kind of season we have. Um, you never know what March is going to bring us. We've had all this warm weather. I bet your buds are pushing right now. And I guarantee you that um, mid-March, we're going to have a snowstorm. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, but, you know, uh, anyway, so mid-April to early May is that range, about a three-week range of where we get peak bloom. In mid-June, the fruits start turning. Uh, the colors, they, they're of course green uh, after, uh, you know, after a few weeks after pollination. They're, they're, th these plants are apomictic. So this variety, this, this, uh, this, these uh, varieties that we're working with, pretty much all the same plant genetically speaking, um, can pollinate themselves. Uh, so you don't need a, a, another variety to work with like Hascap. Um, and they're prolific. Uh, they, they, the, the, the native bees love this plant. Uh, that's primarily what I see on this crop. I don't see honeybees on this. I see native bees, uh, which is really cool. And they do a fantastic job of pollinating this, uh, this fruit. So mid-July, they start, uh, start uh, turning uh, into the red color that you see. And by early August, they're that really dark color uh, in which uh, that's when you start thinking about harvesting. And then so mid-August to early September. By early September around here, the fruit starts to dry up and starts senescing. Sugar concentration gets really high, um, but uh, the fruit itself uh, can, gets like a dried apple and, you know, they're not that tasty. Uh, so depending on the season we've had, depending on the, the growing season, like uh, for instance last year, they, uh, they, they got dry really quick. Two years ago in 2021, I had nice fruit um, up, in, up to October. And uh, it just depends on when they, um, uh, when, you know, uh, what kind of weather we have and how dry it is and, 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 and what, uh, what, 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 what factors will make them want to, uh, to dry out, essentially. Uh, but typically it's mid-August is when I harvest here, primarily because that's when we have our labor. Uh, and, I need a, and I need labor to, to harvest this crop. Uh, you can harvest it with a, with a, with a, with a mechanical harvester, uh, uh, but uh, you've got to set your orchard up correctly to do that. Uh, and uh, what I had here, I didn't have the space for, uh, for a harvester in order to have the money to buy one. Um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, you could harvest anywhere between, uh, if your clusters are like that, uh, you just basically come up behind uh, the cluster and just pull them off. Uh, and so you can get, uh, your, your harvest uh, rates are about mm, maybe 12 pounds an hour. Um, and so you can go through a bush uh, relatively uh, quickly depending on what, uh, how much is on that bush, and you'll be surprised to see what the, what the yield uh, on these bushes are, actually. Uh, so our, my research was, again, nitrogen research. I wanted to know if it affected quality and yield. Um, I was looking at yield, fruit sugar, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the phytochemicals in this crop. I wanted to know how spacing affects fruit quality and yield, mm -hmm. and also anthocyanin development. My colleague down at UMES, we wanted to understand how these anthocyanins uh, would develop over the season, uh, the growing season, and how that related to the bricks. Because if you were a grower and you wanted to sell to pharmaceutical companies, you wanted to sell at the highest anthocyanin content. And if you were a grower that wanted to sell to make jam, you wanted the highest sugar content. So when were those times? And, were they, uh, and did they coordinate with each other? So again, that's where we have my, uh, my plots. A, I put in in, in, uh, 2000, in early 2006. B was 2010. C was 2011. Uh, 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 I, I put in three rows uh, there, uh, and that's basically for irrigation research that I'm going to start up now. Uh, and that was done in 2015. So I've got uh, several rows that I'm working with uh, out there. Uh, I found within five years that we were yielding between 10 and 25 pounds of fruit per bush. Last year, I got uh, one bush that gave me 42 pounds of fruit. 
<laughs> prolific. Um, the bricks is between 15 and 22 percent, depending on when you when you uh, harvest. Uh, most of the time, it's a little under 15, but it's about 15 to 20 percent, 22 percent about the time. 22 percent in September, 15 in mid-August. The yield is very consistent, typically consistent. I've had some up and ups and downs, which made me think that there was some sort of um, alternate bearing with this crop. Um, but uh, as I found out later, I don't know if it was the season, if there was something to do with frost or some other uh, pollination issue, um, but, uh, but that's kind of evened out. And you'll see in a little bit with the graphic that I have um, for yield. Price, the grower that was uh, selling to moms was, uh, was, uh, was doing LQF, uh, individual, IQF, individual quick frozen pounds. And he was selling it for about uh, seven bucks a pound. Um, so uh, what he was able to what he was able to, to to harvest, he was making some pretty decent money off of. He had to find the market though, and it took him three or four years to get there. After he started producing, it wasn't easy. I had a lot of Aroni growers that said, "I've got my fruit. Can you help me find a market?" I was like, "That's not my job. My job was to help you produce the finest quality." You've got to start looking for markets yourself. And a lot of growers have. I got a grower um, in, in, in Frederick who's, uh, who's, who's, who's selling it um, along with their, who's basically making juice out of it and adding it to their apple juice. Um, uh, the growers that I had here um, uh, in, in, uh, uh, on the Eastern Shore, uh, others are just uh, working with it to add to their own um, uh, kind of niche uh, products that they're making, like jams and jellies and such. But you've got to find the market for this crop, especially because it's not an easy sell. Not as easy as, uh, as a fissilis, okay? So um, these were my, uh, uh, by harvest year and calendar. So uh, my, you can see I've got B3, B4, B14, C3, and C14. The B was the plot. The 3 and the 14 is how many grams of nitrogen I applied to each fruit, or each plant, I should say. Uh, so I was applying an eighth of an ounce and a half ounce to compare the difference in yield. I wanted a really big, di uh, a, 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 a big uh, a difference in my treatments to see if there were any real good differences uh, in, in yield. And in time, you could see uh, there were uh, the light blue uh, each year in light blue compared to dark blue, which is not showing up very well on the screen. Um, the dark blue is always giving you higher yields. Why? Because nitrogen grows a bigger plant, and the larger the plant, the more the yield, right? More flowers. So, it was not, a no, not so much of a, a, of a no-brainer, um, but I really wanted to understand how this actually affected yield. You'll also see that, that the blue lines um, are typically, especially past 2016, are a little lower than the uh, green lines uh, per, uh, within the nitrogen treatment. And the, the, the green lines were with, with plot C. Those were planted seven feet apart. In plot B, they were planted three feet apart. Okay, so the reason why plot C has a larger yield is because uh, uh, plot C uh, is, you know, basically the plants have a lot more sunlight. Uh, now the question is, does that make up for uh, the density and, and the yield that you would get uh, with, if you were just to plant them in a higher density uh, as I did in B? This is uh, basically a comparison by, uh, by harvest year because the two uh, plots were, uh, were planted a year apart from each other. I had a problem with the, with the, with the, uh, with the first harvest uh, uh, for, for plot B, which is in 2012, because you'll note when I get into pests that uh, the Japanese beetle came and they completely defoliated my whole orchard. It was the year that I had uh, messed up my knee and I couldn't get out there. I couldn't, I, I, I wasn't able to scout and tell Mike Newell to spray uh, uh, and the, the Japanese beetles came and they just defoliated everything and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the fruit stopped maturing. So I lost that year for a harvest. Uh, but anyways, this is more of a comparison based on year that, uh, you know, the third year, uh, the third harvest of each one of these plots, you can see uh, that a wider spacing creates a greater yield per plant. Does that create greater yield per acre? So this is kind of what we looked at. 
I had about 776 plants per acre um, by, in the three foot spacing and 426 per acre in the seven foot spacing. But by the third harvest, uh, the three foot, or the sixth harvest, the three foot on center plants averaged 12 pounds per plant. And the seven foot on center plants averaged 14 pounds per plant. But look at the production. Because I had higher density, that density overcame. And so it's better for this crop to be planted high, in high dense rows. Uh, and uh, it, it was nice about it. You'd think, well, maybe less sunlight, a lot more crowding, you'd have a, a fruit quality problem. But the anthocyanin content wasn't a whole lot different to make up for that actual increase in yield per acre. So if you're, if you're going to do per acre and you're going for, for mass uh, production, you do the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the higher density. Uh, and that actually helps out when you're when, with certain harvesters that are halfway row harvesters that need to guide along the, um, the, the, uh, the, the, the plant bases. Uh, with a three foot uh, uh, spacing, the half row harvester uh, could guide along. But with a seven foot uh, spacing, the, the harvester wouldn't be able to, uh, to harvest these because be the, the harvester unit would just flip around because it wouldn't be able to guide uh, at, three, at seven foot uh, spacing. So as far as the phytochemicals went, um, and this is plot C, uh, nitrogen, I did conventional or organic nitrogen on, the, uh, on plot C, looking to see if there was a difference between uh, you know, everyone says, you know, organics is much better for, for, for fruit quality. Uh, and I didn't see that in Aronia. Um, I saw it was more of a rate issue. Uh, and uh, uh, I did see that, uh, in, uh, that actually the lower uh, your nitrogen uh, gave it a slightly higher uh, quality uh, than higher nitrogen rates. But again, um, you, 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 you lose so much yield with lower nitrogen rates that they, that may not be uh, the, the biggest uh, problem that you're, you're looking at. Uh, so with anthocyanin content, uh, this, was, uh, this is, was really interesting. More importantly was that the years, that I found more differences within year than I did, um, uh, than I did uh, by, uh, uh, by, by, by nitrogen treatment, organic or conventional. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what was going on. Um, I haven't looked at sunlight. I, I haven't looked at rainfall. 2018 was a, was a huge rainfall year, right? And I had the higher anthocyanin content, so it's not like the, the water diluted it. Um, uh, and the yields weren't that much, they weren't that different, that, that I would have, have, have found uh, that uh, a really big difference in anthocyanin content between, the, between the, the fruit and the treatments. I thought that was rather interesting. Flavonoids. Um, not a whole lot of difference, especially with uh, 18, 17 and 18. So the flavonoids and the anthocyanins, they're all polyphenols. They're all uh, derivatives of the polyphenol group of phytochemicals. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so they're all kind of related in a way. And this is just phytochem uh, this is polyphenols uh, in general. No differences until you got to 2020. And while it's statistically uh, different because the variation was really tight, not a whole lot of difference with, uh, with the treatments either. So um, my recommendations with 14 grams uh, or half ounce after establishment increased yield but not quality. So it didn't matter what you were applying nitrogen wise. It's okay to apply your nitrogen. Aronia loves nitrogen. It grows with nitrogen. Um, and there's some evidence that the low nitrogen had higher quality uh, from the research that we did. But the, if you're, you're, you'd be missing out on yield primarily if you went with lower nitrogen. And the form of nitrogen, organic or, 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 or uh, conventional, had no effect. Uh, lower density had an effect on quantity uh, per plant, but lower uh, uh, yield per acre. And the density had no effect on quality. Uh, quality was more dependent, as I said, on year. Um, again, this is uh, one of those native bees um, that are on Aronia. And they're polluted with native bees. So it's a great pollinator source uh, in the spring if you want to just um, you know, have this as a, uh, as a pollinator crop. Uh, pests and diseases. Uh, Japanese beetle. I can deal with Japanese beetle. The one pest I have a lot of problems dealing with, and if you're an ornamental grower, you know this too, is Japanese maple scale. Uh, this was a difficult uh, a pest to deal with, um, especially if you're organic. Uh, I'm not organic. Uh, I needed to utilize a material that was actually labeled for Japanese beetle 
and um, uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 as a target, uh, aronia. Oddly enough, it's a material called Altacor. And so I could spray this on my aronia to deal with Japanese beetle. And at the same time the Japanese beetle came out, the crawlers of this bugger came out, the scale. So I was able to nail the scale while I was, while I was um, nailing the, the Japanese beetle with Altacor, which was a really a nice coincidence. The other big problem I have with aronia is fusicladium. Fusicladium is, the, in, in, is, is a venturia. It's the non-sexual form of, of apple scab. And aronia gets uh, apple scab really bad. 5% um, of its yield could be lost if you're not careful. Um, this is what happens. This is a normal fruit. And with fusicladium, which hits the crop really early, in early June, you'll start seeing these, uh, these bullseyes and circles on the green. When you start seeing this and it's not on the calyx of the, uh, of the plant, uh, then you know you've got fusicladium. Uh, the fusicladium basically doesn't allow the skin to stretch and it cracks the fruit. Um, it makes it really unsellable and difficult to, to sift through when you're harvesting. Um, this is an, again early, this is a late June uh, infection. You can see the brown lesions on the, on the, on the crop itself. What I was doing um, was primarily working uh, with, I, I tried at first sulfur, uh, a, a material called microthiol, which was labeled for apples. Um, and, uh, and I think it actually was labeled for aronia. Uh, but I was using a blueberry rate. And um, actually, no, it's not labeled for aronia. However, it's one of those exempt uh, products. So you could use it on anything and you're not worried about, you know, uh, labeling and such. Uh, but I was using a blueberry rate, which is low, and I burned out my, my, uh, my crop. So you can't use sulfur on aronia. Learn that early, even though it's an apple. Uh, so the next year, I started using copper, uh, uh, a, a, a copper formula. And, uh, uh, and it, it, it works. It, 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 it's not so bad. Chris? How warm was it when you put the sulfur on? It was um, early. Oh, I, think, well. I think it was, um, I think it was uh, May. Early May, uh, or, or late May, early June. I, I struggle in like, you know, July, beginning of August, you know, when it's really hot, over 90 yeah. degrees on grapes. That's why I was curious. No, I, you know, the, the, I, and I think I remember doing a couple of different sprays, like you do a really early one uh, after flowering and, and such. So it wasn't hot. But it didn't, you know, the, the, the phytotoxic symptoms didn't show up until July. Uh, and it was, so I, I, I sprayed half my crop and half my crop I didn't spray. The crop that I sprayed was affected. The crop that I didn't spray wasn't affected. And so I knew it was the microthiol that did it. This is my research group down at uh, UMES. Uh, Dr. Volkus, um, she runs a program uh, for, uh, for, 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 uh, for chemistry students uh, interested in agricultural uh, technology and chemistry. And it's really cool because we get these students involved in, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in analysis of, 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 of fruit and vegetables. And we use aronia as a model crop. So if anything, what this crop has done is give students a chance to work on phytochemistry. On top of that, um, uh, Dr. Volkus, Vicki Volkus, she's, she's got this incredible mind. And she, she really works with... Um, with what's out there as a polymer chemist. She's got a lot of cool ideas of what she can do with aronia anthocyanins. Um, one, interestingly enough, is she's got a, a research program and a doctorate working on anti-fouling for boats. And she's shown that if you attach aronia anthocyanins to a polymer and paint it on a slide, um, you know, a, a piece of glass, and, 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 and expose that glass to, uh, uh, to bay water, you're going to get less mi uh, microbiological growth on that slide than if you just stuck the slide in um, without any coating on it whatsoever. And fouling starts with microbiological uh, organisms on the surface. And then the whole chain reaction of, of other things feeding on that microbiology starts the whole fouling process. So the Navy is very interested in this. And she's gotten a lot of money to work on aronia. <laughs> Uh, to, uh, to, with the Navy. 
uh, for anti-fouling and some other interesting things. So she's got a whole uh, network of students down there that she's working with uh, and we use Aroni as a model. So if anything co had come out of this project, it was that you know, we're, we've got students involved and really working uh, with, with agricultural technology. On top of that, uh, I've got that, that section D that I talked about. Uh, we've got data loggers uh, and moisture sensors that we've got uh, in the soil and we're going to start the first uh, uh, first uh, uh, of, of, the, of the new data logger control systems that will irrigate based on soil moisture. So it's automatically, the system is autonomous, uh, it senses the soil moisture, you type in what kind of soil moisture you want based on um, a matrix potential or, um, or, or volumetric water content uh, and that system will irrigate to the point where it'll turn off when, when, the mo when the moisture is at a set point and an off point. So an on and an off point. Which is, for, for growers, I think we're all really good at, uh, at, um, at knowing when to turn the water on. We don't know is when to turn the water off. Uh, and with water resources in some locations in Maryland, it's a problem. Certainly out west, water, uh, water uh, can be a, a huge issue. Uh, so uh, we're using Aroni as this, as this crop. Uh, because it's established already and uh, we'll be working with this, um, uh, with this uh, automatic irrigation system, which is really cool. Uh, so there's a lot of new crops available out there. Um, I invite you to, to play with them because you never know what new things you might run across. Uh, talk to me before you do it because maybe I know people who have already played with this crop, like Hascap. I had, I had jumped into it. I wanted to know what it was like. It's not the crop from Maryland. I'm going to try again with, with a few other varieties. Uh, it's start, you want to start small to see what works. You know, and with new plants, get, get new pests, okay? And the problem with growing new plants is that a lot of times they're not labeled, okay? And so you have to tolerate this stuff until labels come up and appear. Aronia was not labeled up until, with anything, up until 2016, when all of a sudden Altacor had Aronia on the label for Japanese beetle. I don't know, it was, it was, it was synergy, it was fantastic. And it came at the right time. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's one of the wor most difficult things when you're working with new crops is you get these new pests in that you don't know that were, that were out there uh, and you can't do anything about it. Uh, so you gotta be real careful. All right, uh, can I answer any questions? Am I really late? Me, good. Okay. <laughs> 251. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, so here we go. Yeah, look at that. So some really crazy. So another problem that I had with Aronia was, uh, and this is, was, was really never an issue, uh, was uh, a gymnosporangium or rust. So it would get quince uh, a cedar rust. And, um, and it, I, we had some really cool fruit looking fruit um, that, that came out of that. Uh, anyways. Uh, so I, had, I have a number of different pictures of the different uh, funny fruit that came off of that. Um, but anyways, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. If not, um, if you don't uh, have any questions now, you can contact me uh, through uh, this email, arist.umd.edu. I'd be happy to answer any questions or help you along the way.